bring love into your heart now and send it to everybody on the planet. Welcome to our final presentation of the Globe Sound Healing Conference, and that would be me. Today I'm going to be going over how we can use sound for 
all or most physical, emotional, and mental issues. All right, so let's begin here. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> a lot of this information, in fact, most of this information has come from <clears throat> the Medical Sound Association and our students. Over the last two years, our stu or 10 years, our students have been, uh, had assignments to create treatment plans for all these different issues that we're gonna be talking about. So I've collated them over the years, and then we also had meetings with the Medical Sound Association to refine these treatment plans. In the Medical Sound Association, we have over 400 doctors and sound therapists now helping to figure out how to heal every disease in the world. Just a small, small idea, right? And <clears throat> The uh, association meets every, every two months or so. You can join at medicalsoundassociation.com. Uh, we actually launched the association last year in the conference, and now it's, uh, we've made some headway. All of the treatment plans that I'm talking about are actually uh, in detail, in minute, way more detail than I'm going to be showing you here on the Medical Sound Association site. I'll show you where that is in just a bit. Right? So <clears throat> this is not just my work. That's a lot of work from a lot of people that's contributed to this. The basis of all sound healing is chaotic versus coherent, stable, consistent sounds. Chaotic sounds are like fear, anger, fear, like Eah! or anger, Arr! or anxiety, Eah! right, or stress. Ah, or pain, right, versus the coherent sounds, which are the vowels and all of the sound healing instruments. The vowels like this. The definition of peace is a stable, consistent vibration. All of the crystal bowls, Tibetan bowls, the uh, <clears throat> didgeridoos, I mean, the tuning forks, every instrument, even the rhythm instruments create a stable, consistent rhythm. And that overcomes the chaos, which is the problem. And so even if you don't know what you're doing, it works, right? Because you're doing these stable sounds, and often people love it. When you know what you're doing, you can get really detailed and do even uh, better work. And that's what we're talking about here today. Right? Chaotic and coherent manifest in the body and in geometries as well. Here's chaotic cells that are kind of been broken up that have uh, uh, that are not doing well. Whereas when a cell is healthy, it's actually very symmetrical, right? So it corresponds in that way. <clears throat> but it's not just frequency. It's the, what I call the hierarchy of vibration, you can work at many levels. We've got the frequency level, which can be really great when we find the frequency of something, and we can resonate it into its healthy, natural frequency in the body. But we can also work at the timbre level, which is simply a combination of frequencies, <clears throat> which are called harmonics. When you have multiple harmonics, that makes up a tonality, or a, a general color of a sound. And it's actually a waveform, a complex waveform. So that accounts for all the different waveforms, such as um, uh, uh, all the, the instrument sounds and all of the uh, vowels and syllables that you can make with the voice. Right? But then we have the level where we have multiple timbres, multiple sounds, like three notes on a piano. Right? And you have musical intervals within the, those three notes. So now you get some more emotional capacity. And different chords can be very harmonious or very dissonant, very activating or very calming. And then you add rhythm, and you now get music. Right? And with rhythm, we can entrain the brain into different brainwave states. We can also entrain the heart into a certain rhythm. And sometimes even the breath gets entrained into that rhythm as well. <clears throat> but there's also, when you add melody with the rhythm, oh my God, you can access every emotional state you can imagine, 
right? The emotional capacity is unbelievable in music. You can get really excited and high and dance, right? Or you can get really calm and peaceful and get really still. Or you can even get really sad or really joyful. I mean, there's a full range we all know from music, right? So it's really powerful. But the most powerful is the energy level, where we're actually working with intention or just an energy uh, uh, field, you know, a, a, type of con a, a type of consciousness. So you can hold an a intention for a certain type of healing or a certain outcome, and that's really effective. Or you can actually just be in the zone where you are in the love, in the light, and just bring that energy forward into the session, and, and, and then let source just take care of it, right? So you can work at all of these levels when working at <clears throat> on any issue, physically, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually. Right? Now, I've gotten a download. I mentioned this, I think, in the brain conference last year, but I got this really cool download that um, at four in the morning, I have these ideas popped in my head, and um, uh, it was that we needed to find the actual musical relationship between the heart, brain, and breath when you're in the zone. Well, there's multiple zones. There's peace, there's heart coherence when you're running gratitude, compassion, love, higher emotions. This is what heart math talks about. And then there's oneness, which is also measurable by EEG. You can now see when someone's one with the universe. So I called up Roland McCready at heart math and I said, okay, can you send us readouts of people in heart coherence from the heart, brain, and breath? And he said, okay, so we just got those readouts and we're finding that they the relationship between heart, brain, and breath are octaves. I, we have to average out the heart because it's going up and down in tempo, so we have to average out it, the heart to get its stable, uh, a set tempo, and then we look at the relationship between that average and the brain, average of the heart and the brain, and then also the breath. The breath is much slower, actually, but they're all octaves. I, we thought they would be in, in, in harmony, but octaves is real harmony, right? Sometimes unison. So they're like double. Octaves means double the, the rhythm, right? Or half the rhythm. So they're in coherence. That means we can actually take these rhythms and then octavize it up and play a chord. So now what we're looking at is then finding the actual rhythm and melody of each of the 11 systems in the body. We're talking about all of the different systems from circulatory, respiratory, all the systems that there are in the body medically. And so first we need to find the rhythm, but the rhythm is going to be easy because it's going to be in direct relationship to the heart, brain, and breath when you're in the zone, right? It's not going to be some weird rhythm that's not in sync with the rest of the system, especially when you're in the zone at peace or running heart coherence or one with the universe, right? So it's going to be pretty fi easy to figure out. It might be a musical fifth, which is a three to two relationship that's really still very harmonious. Maybe a musical fourth, four to three, or a, th a musical third. But I bet most of them are going to be octaves and unison, which is just double, right? So that's going to be pretty easy to figure out uh, just by looking at the metabolism of each of those systems and energy running through it. But then we need to find out the actual melody. So the first step of finding a melody of any system is figuring out where you're going to look for the note, notes, right? In a meridian, you've got <clears throat> uh, the acupuncture points, which are the nodes. So we can actually, uh, when the energy flows through a meridian, it's actually playing a song. Bum, 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 right? At a very specific tempo. So we got to find the nodes to m where we're going to measure for the notes inside each of the 11 systems. So we got a whole group of doctors. If there's anybody out there uh, that's listening to this presentation, give me a call, email david at soundhealingcenter.com, and uh, we can help figure out those nodes. We already have a nice group that have shown up. Okay, so then with the device that John Stuart Reed's been talking about, the Raman spectroscopy, we can actually find the notes of the nodes. 
the, the Raman device is an electron microscope that will actually tell you the precise harmonic content of cells in real time, scientifically. Right? So we can measure each of the nodes and figure out not only the note, but the harmonic content, which will have a fundamental, which will be the main note of that <clears throat> node. So now we've got the whole melody of each of the 11 systems, right? We've got a way to figure it out with just a little research, right? And then we can use electrodes with needles or, uh, uh, or uh, needles with frequencies or electrodes, electromagnetic, you know, electrodes. And uh, uh, we can also use microcurrents or we can also use infrared. And we can play that song through each of the systems, that river of flow to break through any blockages and heal every disease in the world. And this, this song through each of the 11 systems will be tuned precisely to you, right? So it's exactly way, the way your system is running those rhythms and melodies through each of the 11 systems. <clears throat> I can't wait to, to be able to sit and listen to all 11 of my songs at once. And they'll be in complete harmony when I'm healthy and in the zone. Maybe a few a little off here and there, right? Oh, there, that system's not really flowing too well. Right? Oh, this could be, it's going to be really amazing. And then be able to run that flow of perfection, that song, through each of the systems for each person and myself, right? Okay, but then the next step is based on this hierarchy, using the Raman device or some other device to find the actual frequency of each of the... 70 trillion cells, right? It's a little, kind of a big project, right? It's going to need artificial intelligence, uh, AI, to be able to map out the musical interval relationship of all the cells within each of the 11 systems. The ba basis of the body is it's in harmony when you're healthy and especially when you're in the zone. Right? It's all in harmony. That means that these musical interval relationships between the cells are not going to be some weird dissonant interval. They're going to be most likely one, three, and five. Right? right? Which are the main musical intervals in the harmonics of vibration that make up the whole universe. <laughs> that was a big one. Okay, let that sink in for a second. So. It's so cool. I can imagine, and the people I've been talking to uh, are saying, yeah, I bet it's just going to be one, three, five, and octaves and unison, right? But it's going to be this beautiful harmony. And I'm thinking, oh, maybe it's different for different cultures. And, um, and, uh, and then this psyche, for what it's worth, said, nope, this is the template of perfection for a human. I'm like, holy moly, this is like the holy grail then we can resonate the entire body into its template of perfection, right? People have different musical flows through those musical intervals, and that's what makes us different. But the parts of the body, physically, and even, uh, uh, well, we'll see, mentally and emotionally, but in the brain, of course, have very specific interval relationships. Everybody's different, so everybody's frequencies are going to be different, but the relationships... We're, we're betting, and I'm feeling really strongly about it these days, and a lot of people agree, are going to be set. They're going to be the same from person to person, the relationship between the frequencies, right? So that's our big project. If anybody's interested in that one, give me a call, because it we're, we're, uh, uh, looks like we have complete funding to do this, and I'm really excited about it. So uh, there you go. <laughs> okay. So the whole deal, as I've talked about before, is to use, to work at all levels. Ultimately, we're going to be working at the level of not only physical, which I mostly was just talking about, but also mental and emotional as well, and even spiritual. You know, how do all of these interact? So if we work at all four levels, like I say, the more ways you lead a horse to water, the more chances it will drink. Will work physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. I mean, ultimately, the hospital should be, you go in the hospital and they say, 
oh, you got this physical problem, go into the emotional room. Let's see what emotion caused this, right? And we'll release that sucker, right? Go into the mental room and we're going to play binaural beats and work with you with the brain, right? Go, uh, uh, let's go into the room of spirituality, right? Oh, you're not spiritual? Okay, we'll take you into the garden and just get tuned to nature, right? That's the way a hospital should ultimately be, ultimately be. <laughs> right? Yeah, right. One day, we'll, it will happen. Okay. Okay. So, we're now going to go through different issues, very specific issues. And once again, these came from our, our students and from the uh, doctors and sound therapists in our Medical Sound Association. Right? And if you go to medicalsoundassociation.com slash integrative sound, or just go to medicalsoundassociation.com and look for the... the uh, menu item, integrative sound, you'll find all of these treatment plans for all the different issues we're going through. And they're, way, again, way more detailed than what we're going to go through here. The way we've organized it is we talk about, in each of the treatment plans, the information about the issue medically, right? the causes of it medically, as far as is known, current medical treatments, and the types of people, uh, like uh, different people have... Uh, are, uh, respond to different issues or, or the way they are around issues is different. Like, for example, for, for PTSD, I mean, panic attacks are quite different uh, than regular anxiety. But also, um, it's like children are quite different than people that are really, really like first responders and really strong. Right? So there's, that affects affects uh, the, the treatment we're going to come up with. So all of this information, the medical information, is used to figure out the framework, the way we're going to approach that issue, right? Later, we're going to talk uh, in, the, in the treatment plans. We, we give some actual treatments you could do. But the, really, the conceptual framework of the approach is really the most important because you could do uh, once you know the approach, you could do sound in many ways and still be within that framework, right? So that's what we're going to be looking at today is just the conceptual framework because that's how to approach an issue based on sound. They're also in those treatment plans on the Medical Sound Association. We've got safety guidelines, really important if we're going to bring this into, the, into hospitals. We have a full range of intake questions, which are often critical to actually get to know what type of sound treatment you're going to actually do. And then we have the sound treatments and then treatments other than sound that people have come up with and then homework for the patient, what they could do uh, uh, on their own afterwards. So this is the outline on the Medical Sound Association site. Today we're just going through the conceptual framework. So we're just giving a, the overview of it today. Okay. So let's look at different issues. Here's the deal. When you get a diagnosis, the first thing you have to do is go, okay, <clears throat> I now set my intention this is going to be completely gone. Because the second you go into fear, you're in trouble, right? You really have to be careful. I mean, it's good to get a diagnosis so you know what, what things to do, right? But you can't go into fear. I had a health issue. I had some blood clots last year, right? I immediately, when the doctor told me, I immediately did this. I, this, I was like, wait a second. You know, he's saying, you know, the chances of you dying are this percentage. And I'm like, nope, right? It's like my brother has fourth stage prostate cancer. He says, you know, on average, the uh, people die in two years from what I have. So I've given myself two years. And I'm like, what? What do you mean? Set your intention that it will be completely gone. It's like my friend said that she got fibroids, and fibroids don't go away. And she said she visualized going to the doctor and the doctor's jaw dropping open, right, because the fibroids were completely gone. And she went, she visualized the, the fibroids gone, and it happened. They're completely gone. And she went to the doctor, and the doctor's jaw dropped open. I did the same, and now all blood clots are completely gone out of my system, 
right? So it's just critical. When you get a diagnosis, they should send you into a room immediately and say, okay, there's the st statistics. Now let's set the intention that you're going to heal perfectly or it's already a done deal, right? <laughs> so that's really critical right in the beginning of whenever you have any issue, okay? Okay. <laughs> now, a lot of these treatments that we're going to be, uh, uh, issues that we're going to be focusing on there's treatments we can do with brainwave and treatment. So I want to uh, give a little review of what we talked about in the last conference in April on brainwave and treatment. Right. With brainwave and treatment, there are different rhythms that will entrain the brain into different brainwave states. Epsilon, delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. And these different states are good for different things. Let's go through them. So we've got the, the uh, delta. Oh, let me backtrack here. So the main thing about these states, brainwave states, is that everybody's rhythm in these, this range, for example, in delta, 0.5 to 3.5 cycles per second, everybody's rhythm of their brain in delta when you're asleep is a little bit different. Same in theta, same in alpha. Everybody's a little bit different. But what's cool is when you learn a person's rhythm of their brain, well, that rhythm is actually a note. It's actually, I mean, if you octavize it up, it's actually a note. So when you find the note of that rhythm, so if you double a rhythm, it becomes a frequency, right? Whoa, 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 na, 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 brrr, ooh, ee, right? So those are all the same note because they're doubled. So when you find the note of delta, <clears throat> it's the same for theta, alpha, and beta. It's just doubled for each brainwave state. So the point here is when you find your rhythm for each of these states, the, the uh, uh, binaural beats and brainwave entrainment work way better. Right, and the research is really definitive on that. We, we do this uh, at, in our sound therapy center, which we can do online. We can find your rhythm and get the binaural beats tuned to you. Right? Okay. So there's also left and right brain synchronization. If you use headphones, you can actually synchronize the left and right brain across the corpus callosum, which is also really cool besides the different brainwave states. Here are the different brainwave states. Delta, 0.5 up to three and a half, whoa, 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 whoa. That's deep sleep. That's the rhythm of your brain when you're uh, one with the universe being regenerated, right? It's also deep meditational state, right? And again, everybody's rhythm's a little bit different, but uh, this is the really important state because it's where you're completely being regenerated by source. When you go into deep sleep delta, you are one with source being re regenerate, regenerated. If you don't go back at least an hour and a half per night, you will die. So it's really critical. So that's the, one of the slower rhythms, delta. And then we have theta, which is from like whoa, 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 all the way up to whoa, 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 whoa. And this is the dream state where you're dreaming. It's also, it's like dr uh, um, the... Um, um, a waking dream state when you're in the zone. It's where you get creative downloads, right? It's also when you're one with the universe or, or in just in the zone at all, you're in theta, in that rhythm. Your brain is in that rhythm, right? It's also where you are when you're under anesthesia and they say it's the address of the subconscious. So that's in hypnotherapy. They take you into this theta state, which is a little spaced out state, right? to access the subconscious and reprogram it, right? This is very cool state, especially for being one with the universe, right? Then there's alpha, ma 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 Relaxed attention, present, alert, ready for learning, ready for sports, right? It's also where you get creative uh, problem-solving downloads, where you're trying to figure something out and the answer just pops in your head, right? So. Each one of these brainwave states can help you in different issues. Beta helps with overcoming ADD, right? 
because that's where thinking and processing ha happens, is at this very fast brainwave state. And a lot of people can't go into that brainwave state uh, that fast, so they give them speed. We'll talk about that with ADD in a bit. And then the really fast brainwave state is like, it's actually a frequency, it's not even a rhythm anymore. It's like, ooh, that's actually gamma, where you're in this high state of meditation and the whole world slows down. When your brain goes that fast, everything becomes way more still around you, right? And that's uh, uh, just bliss, the bliss state, right? Then there's epsilon, which is a hypnagogic state, which is below 0.5 cycles per second. Jeffrey Thompson talks more about uh, these in detail in his presentation. And if you really want to check it out, my presentation in the uh, oh, sound for the brain conference last April. I go into it in minute detail. Okay, so these are the different brainwave states you can use with rhythms in headphones that entrain your brain into these different states. <clears throat> this brainwave entrainment's really good for sleep, right? The research, there's research projects that show it's incredibly effective when you find your delta which is where you are with the rhythm of your brain when you're asleep, and you match the binaural beats to the rhythm of your natural delta, uh, it can help you go to sleep really well. And for some people, it helps you stay asleep through the night. Right? So this is just major. We can find your, you know, with all this brainwave stuff, we can find your note and get you CDs in delta, theta, alpha, and beta for all these different issues. So it's just, it's, it's really quite amazing how effective it is, you know, to, when it's tuned to you. Now, one thing I want to say about sleep, though, when it comes to sound, really, when you think about s whether you're going to sleep well at night, it's really a function of how at peace you are through the day. If you're stressed out through the day and you expect to get a good night's sleep, well, maybe, right? Because your system's still buzzing, right? So really the main way to help sleep issues with sound is to use sound to go to a state of peace and stillness multiple times throughout the day. So your whole system gets used to this peace and stillness, which leads you right into sleep, right? So you're not trying to, to mellow out. You're mellow through the day. That's the whole deal. So to really stop and do even a one or two minute meditation with sound, right? Or to listen to a song that brings you to that still point. Play a crystal ball or listen to a crystal ball. Listen to anything that brings you to that still point, right? That's really, really the deal. And then you'll go to sleep much better, right? So it's not, it's nice to use binaural beats right before you go to sleep, but <laughs> mellow out through the day is the deal. So your whole system gets in that, <clears throat> that, mode of relaxation. You're not in fight and flight through the whole day. That's, that's the deal. Okay. Then there's anxiety. When it comes to anxiety, there's really quite a difference between panic attacks and general anxiety. When someone's having a panic attack, they are really fragile. And you have to be really careful with sound because <clears throat> it can trigger the panic attack. There's very few sounds that are helpful for panic attacks that don't, that aren't too activated. Crystal balls, way can be way too much. Those pure tones that are activated can be way too much for for someone having a panic attack. You know, warm sounds, right? So there's a, whereas you know, general anxiety is, you know, some people uh, people with general anxiety can often handle a lot still. They just got anxiety going on. Like we work with first responders and, you know, goodness, I mean, turn it up, right? They're, they're, they're strong. They're very strong people, right? So you don't have to worry about them get, being overwhelmed with the sound at all, even though they got anxiety, right? Okay, so let's look at the different conceptual frameworks for anxiety that we came up with, with the uh, 
doctors and sound therapists and our students. First of all, you know, as we're going to talk about in every one of these um, treatment plans, going to a place of peace is really the whole deal. I mean, it works for everything. When you're at peace, your system works better. Your immune system works better. Your organs go into alignment. Your emotional state is better. Your mental state is better. Even You're even able to access higher dimensions spiritually better when you're at peace. So throughout all of these, you know, we can find certain frequencies to bring you into a peace. Low frequencies are often better, but certain frequencies, you know, might... Uh, specific frequencies for like the frequency of your soul, right? Or of your, your metabolism, that could be really cool. You can get very specific on different organs, but, uh, or the brain, as we just talked about, right? You can also have very uh, specific sounds that bring you into peace, right? Uh, and so you figure out the sounds that are best for that person. Certain musical intervals are more peaceful than others. And then there's music that will bring people to peace. Some people like uh, some music, some like others, right? And then you can use your intention to bring people to peace as well. With anxiety, when I say dynamic curve, what we're talking about is for panic attacks, you want to just bring people down, down, down more and more and more mal mal and ma low right i mean that's it's all about just bringing them slower and and more calm and peaceful and then getting to that still point now, there's also, once you get to that still point, and this is true in a lot of treatments, you can start exploring what's causing the anxiety. So you look at transforming those causes. So you can actually look at ways to be at peace in the midst of anxiety uh, uh, causing situations. And, uh, but, you know, first of all, you do have to look at to whether they're ready and willing to go. If a person is really f uh, to, to actually practice doing sound in the midst of a of a uh, anxiety causing situation right that can be really it's like desensitizing but you know if someone's really fragile they're not ready to actually actually um, uh, uh, have like some annoying sound or some something annoying where they're trying to overcome it with their own breath or their own sound or their own gratitude or love right we have a whole class on 11 techniques for, for being at peace in the midst of, of uh, challenges and conflicts, right? So, uh, but also another one is bring awareness of their physical body. You could just, if they're not having panic attacks, the sound lounge can be really good for, for um, uh, uh, getting people uh, to a place of peace and stillness, both physically in their body and emotionally and mentally. So that's really cool. You could use tuning forks on the body. You could use crystal bowls on the body. Uh, get a, a hand drum close to the body. Get them physically in their body if they're not too fragile. And then also expressing their emotions with sound. Often what's blocking it and causing anxiety is people aren't able to express themselves. Right? And a lot of the other um, <clears throat> conference presentations are all about expressing yourself, uh, especially uh, Christina Wells, right? and various others as well. But then you can also take people to the higher perspective. Now, when I talk about higher perspective, you know, there are some people that can do sound and just bring you into this realm of love and light. You know, it's hard to describe if you haven't experienced it or hard to do if you, you don't know how to do it. But the, it's amazing when, you know, I'm in a treatment or a sound bath and it's like the whole room turns into white light. People are just bawling and crying and it's just like healing everywhere right so bringing people into that higher perspective connected to source is really really excellent right but also you can just say you are not the anxiety you are a stable 
consistent vibration. Don't identify with this chaotic vibration. That is not you. You are a soul that is stable. You are a point of awareness that's stable. You are a, a, uh, uh, a body that's mostly stable, right? Even though you have anxiety, it's, like, it's not like the whole body's doing it. You are a stable vibration that is you, and you are part of source, which is stable. You are not the anxiety. That's really cool. There's other things we, uh, we talk about in the actual treatment plan. So that's anxiety and the conceptual frameworks for that. Okay. ADD, it's really about brainwave entrainment at beta, right? And again, beta, the main type of ADD is that people can't go fast enough. And that's the classic ADD. And that's like 80%, 70, 80% of ADD is the classic ADD, where the brain doesn't go fast enough, right? So they give people speed to speed them up to that really fast rhythm of beta, right? And, but you can totally entrain the brain into this fast beta by simply finding their note in beta, or finding their note by playing each of the 12 notes. Jeffrey Thompson does it in way more detail. And then actually giving them a CD in that note and rhythm of beta of them, tuned to them, right? And then they get totally entrained into that beta and they can think no side effects. And it's actually a cure because it actually creates new neural pathways in the system. This is very cool. Uh, what, what we've talked about is looking at other, doing research to, to figure out with brainwave entrainment and sound to actually address all of these. I don't know the details of these well enough to even say maybe what we're doing has already helped with most of them, but um, you know, I'm sure some of them have different variations, right? So that's where we're headed. So ADD is really helped a lot easily with brainwave entrainment in beta. Then we have traumatic brain injuries. Brainwave entrainment in delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma is the deal. Because when you have a traumatic brain injury, it goes into chaos. It's like, it's like, ah, right? That's what pain and any trauma creates. Ah. So you're getting these stable, consistent rhythms of delta, theta, alpha, and beta, mum, 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 tuned precisely to where your brain is at rest, where your brain is naturally humming at peace, right? In each of those levels throughout the day, delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma, right? This is really effective. I had a guy that had uh, gotten beat up in a uh, bar, and he uh, was on Adderall for 10 years, and then we found his note and gave him the binaural beats, and within a week, he was off Adderall, and his energy was completely focused again. It was dramatic. I had a good friend that was in a uh, motorcycle accident just two months ago, went flying across the road, and we gave him the binaural beats, and it was within a week his brain started synchronizing again. It's very, very effective, right? Okay. Then we've got PTSD and trauma and first responders. I, this is also brainwave entrainment tuned to them, gets them out of this chaotic PTSD situation in the brain and stabilizes it so they are at peace, stable, and still throughout the day. It's one of the best. But uh, there's other aspects that we can get into. We'll get in, uh, that, well, let's get into it in more detail here. This is the conceptual framework from this treatment plan. First of all, <clears throat> With the intake questions, this is a, can be a big deal. The, the deal here is with PTSD and trauma, there is a real danger of re-triggering that trauma. So you have to be really careful. Right? There are people that ha completely freak out and, uh, when they get their trauma re-triggered and can even do suicide or hurt others, right? So you do have to be very careful when, when working with it. So with the intake questions, you're really developing this trust and connection to the person so that they trust you. Because a lot of people with, with uh, PTSD and trauma do not want to talk about it. You know, 
In fact, they've maybe never talked about, you know, what happened in the war, right? So it can be very tricky to get them to express themselves, and it's a slow process because, again, you don't want to re-trigger it. Again, peace is always the deal. Get them to a place, place of peace, and so they are at rest, right? The whole system works better. And we went through all the different ways you can get play, people to a place of peace, right? Also, to get them to a place of peace before you actually have them talk about or see if they want to talk about what actually happened, right? <clears throat> so if they are shut down, what you can do, and it's a bit of a process, is get them where they're comfortable making sound. Some people, it could take a little while, but because a lot of people are so scared to make, make sound, it's kind of a, a cultural thing, right? So you just like get them to, first of all, to do call and response. Here, make this sound. Wee, and they go, wee, and you go, la, la, right? And then, ee right? And you just do a lot of call and response until they're very comfortable making weird sounds. And get weird, make some weird sounds, right? Play. It's just we turn it into like fun, right? And then do gibberish, blah, 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 right? Until they're totally comfortable making sound. Then you go, okay, what would that trauma sound like? So they don't have to express it with words, but what would it sound like? For, for actually, you even get into uh, like expressing how they feel that day right, before you get into the trauma. Say, how do you feel? Like, well, this is the way I feel today. Right, or wee, right? So you get them to express how they feel, and then you get, start seeing if they, if they are ready to start expressing that trauma with sound, right? It's very cool to unlock that big block, that big storage chest of emotions that are just stuck big time, right? If, there, if you get to the level where you can really then transform those feelings into love and light, into beauty, into something really beautiful, if they're ready, right? So now you're actually not just expressing them, you're transforming them. We, we talked about different vocal techniques where we can take a uh, a trauma and make the sound of it and slowly transform it into something really beautiful like this. You could do that with instruments as well. You could even bang a gong, right? Gongs are really good for getting, uh, have them like hit a gong really hard and really move the energy if they're ready for it and then move it into the sound of a crystal ball and say, this is where we're headed now to something more coherent and beautiful, right? Not the gongs are bad, but, but they're more for, for transformation. So, so there's a lot of ways to do transformation. Desensitizing, like we were talking about with anxiety, we can actually play sounds, got to be really uh, careful. In the class that I do on uh, holding frequency, where we do 11 techniques for uh, dealing with uh, 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 conflict and, uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, different issues, then um, well, I actually play these horrible electronic sounds. And then we do toning, we do letting go, letting it be, we do being in your body, we do gratitude, we do compassion for the, the crazy sounds. We do love for them, and we see which ones work for the person. And then we could say, okay, let's play whatever triggers you the most. Sound of bombs, sound of gunshots. One guy had his big trigger was, was babies crying, right? And then you slowly, once they have the technique down, you slowly work into having them face their worst sounds with their own sounds and be at peace. Okay. Also, you can look at it from a higher perspective, look at it from a cognitive or, or spiritual perspective, rewrite the story. 
You know, it's the basis of hypnotherapy. Imagine it was it happened a different way. The brain doesn't know any different, right? And do the sound of what it would feel like if it hadn't happened. And then also, again, not identifying with it. You're not the trauma. You're a stable, consistent vibration. And then uh, work on, you know, access, accessing this higher uh, self and source information, right? If they can't, you just do it for them to bring them into that energy. And then it's really mastering emotions and witnessing emotions. So you play with a whole range of emotions with sound and get so that they're really comfortable with any emotion, right? Opening up their system from being shut down, right? Again, okay. If anybody has any ideas for any of these treatment plans as I'm going through it, you can look on the website at Medical Sound Association and then read through it and then send me your ideas because this is a work in process, right? And you can even join the association and help re refine these as well. Okay, that's PTSD and trauma. Okay, now Ed Rupert <coughs> in Colorado is using our sound lounges and he's responsible for 4,000 first responders. And his, his company is 911overwatch.org. And he's got a whole team of doctors and, and, um, and um, therapists. And if anybody has a crisis, they call Ed. If any first responder has a crisis, which means about to commit suicide, right? Ed saved over 150 lives in the last year with our sound lounges. He goes out with a van and puts them on the sound lounge, and it's just amazing how effective it's been. Um, Ed also teaches classes on how to work with first responders and very serious work. This is not for the lighthearted, right? This is really just incredibly angelic work, right? To the work that Ed's doing and to be able to help the first responders is incredible. It's like Ed says, they're in the war every day, right? They're in the war every day, okay? So that's Ed Rupert in Colorado. We're looking to set up this system throughout the US. The Colorado is the only state that has a, a detailed system like this for first responders, right? So with our funding, we're looking at setting that up. If anybody's interested, give me a call. Email me at david at soundhealingcenter.com. Autism, the best uh, thing to do, as Jeffrey Thompson's research shows, is to find their note and give them binaural beats. If you can get them to listen to it in delta, theta, alpha, and beta, get them back to their normal rhythm, right? That's really cool. Well, there's a lot of other things we do with autism. One is finding the music and instruments they love and keep track, keep detailed track. If they can play an instrument, because it's a big difference depending on where they are on the spectrum, right? Some, some people high on the spectrum, you can't approach them even, right? They're so sensitive to any outside stimulus. So depending on the spectrum, they might be able to play an instrument, right? And, but, uh, and, and so just check it out, what instruments and music they love. Uh, brainwave entrainment, also sound on the body. Again, if they're hypersensitive, that's not gonna work. You know, sound table's not gonna work with somebody that's like really high on the spectrum. What we did in a, a, a autism centers, we, we thought to actually put sound pillows in the meditation room where they hang out a few times in the day and see if they gravitate to the sound pillows. And if they do, then we can say, hey, like, you wanna try the sound table, right? So we don't just freak them out with sound on the body, you know. Tuning forks on the body could be very cool, right, if they're not overly sensitive. Right? You just got to pay close attention. Nonverbal communication can be really great, especially for those high on the spectrum, where you, you basically, you just pay attention to their mood and their energy and their rhythm, and you match that. So it's like, you know, you see them kind of smile, and you go, wee, I will be. And then they kind of go, what? And you go, what? And then they, they kind of laugh, and you go, wee, right? And so you're, you're mirroring their emotions with sound. So they don't have to actually use verbal communication, right? They can... Ultimately, when you do this, you, they ultimately learn that they can communicate to you with sound, right? And not have to make words. And they see there's a connection. 
And that's the whole point, is really to develop a real connection without words. Right? Very cool for autism. Right? Dementia is actually very similar in the treatment plan. First, we find the music and instruments they love and the instruments they love to play. What's the best is if you can work with someone who's in the earlier stages of dementia and do a lot of work with instruments and music, not only the music they love, but the uh, sound healing music to see what they love there, right? And track in detail every instrument, every song that they love. So when they get into later stages of dementia, you can totally play what worked when they were in earlier stages, right? This is very cool, very cool. Because there's already, uh, you know, lots of videos and evidence on online, including the, uh, the movie um, um, uh, Alive Inside, where they actually show, you know, uh, to people with dementia and Alzheimer's waking up when you play songs they loved, right? But now we're getting way more detailed because it's not just songs they love, but songs they love now, right? And instruments and instruments they want to play. Brainwave entrainment tuned to them can be so effective if you can get them to listen to it, right? It's very cool because now you're getting their brain back into a stable, consistent vibration. Sound on the body, if not too fragile, we got to watch it. We've got to do very slow tests with the amount of vibration and the volume because some people who have dementia, are, are, they're not, it's, it's too much, right? So you really got to watch closely. But for those that can handle it, and the sound table, sound pillows, uh, or even, you know, the bass pod that we'll talk, show you in a bit, or the bass uh, uh, belt can be really good for pain on different parts of the body. Right, very excellent for getting their whole system to a state of peace. I've got a, a, the Brain CD, which is a frequency CD uh, that uh, one of our students had, uh, her mom had advanced dementia, and every time she played it for her, she would wake up. So it's really worth trying there, the Brain CD we have, the Cymatic CD. Right. And then, again, learning nonverbal communication, just like with the with the autism, right? Teach them in the earlier stages of dementia how to actually express how they feel non-verbally. So when they get into later stages, they don't have to use, use uh, verbal, right? It's much easier. It's like, how are you doing? Well, yeah, right? It's, we're actually working with a dementia company in Northern California here, and we had a meeting, and one of the, the uh, people that, that is on the front lines working she, um, she said, oh, yeah, George, he just mumbles a lot. And she said, last week, I just mumbled back to him. And we had a really great co conversation, right? <laughs> it's great. Any way you can create connection through nonverbal communication and to get them comfortable making sound is very cool. Okay. okay. Then we have depression. <clears throat> I want to play you a song about depression here in a second. Again, getting them to a state of peace is good, but you know, playing songs that are activating in this peaceful state, because you want more activation. If you play something too mellow, they may never get out of bed, right? So you get them to play, play instruments, you know, make sounds with the voice, anything you can get them to do movement. It's like it's really, really effective. I'll play the song here in just a minute. Uh, also, meet them where they at, are at and slowly bring them into activation. You know, more activated rhythms, alpha brainwave states, or beta even, but mostly alpha. Also, you know, uh, uh, musical intervals that are more activating, higher frequencies are more activating. But if you, or even the gong, right? But if you start with too much activation, they're going to say, get out of here, leave me alone. Right? So you have to meet them where they're at and build up slowly over time, like even like 10 to even 30 minutes, where you're just slowly leading them into excitement and, and, and awakeness and joy and things like that. And most people will go with you if you go slow enough, right? They don't know what happens. It's just like you move so slow, they don't know what happened by the time they're in this joyful state. Uh, and then, 
after getting them to this peaceful state, you can like look at you know what's causing this and actually use sound to release the stuck emotions around it, and then bring them into a higher perspective. So it's not it's not like oh you know it sucks that that's who I am. I'm a depressed person. No. You're not a depressed person. You are a spirit. You're a pure spirit that's beautiful. It's just this, this energy that's wafting through you. It's not you, right? And, and then get them into this, this perspective of maybe even helping others who have been depressed. Okay? I want to play this song. It's a pretty long song. It's about 10 minutes of, that we use for depression. Oh, I just... Oh, there we go. Yes. Okay. This I did for um, um, Massachusetts General Hospital, right? So just enjoy this. It's called Low Mood.
What a journey, huh? We've got other CDs, antidepressant. We have the depression relief CD, which are frequencies. They're not s music. And we even uh, have a tapping script that goes along with the frequencies. So um, it's really effective. You don't even have to do tampi tapping. You just listen to the depression relief frequencies while reading the actual script. It's very cool. Okay, so that's depression. Okay. Grief. Grief is really two different stages that are dealt with differently. One is not feeling, and the other is technically, uh, medically, it's called complicated grief, where people are just grieving all the time. You know, it's like the person not feeling is like they're shut down. They're just not feeling it. They have to go back to work, right? Or the person's got complicated grief. I had a, a student, actually, who uh, said that uh, her husband died and that she was crying three or four times every day. And I said, well, how long ago did he die? And she goes, two years ago. I'm like, wow, you're feeling completely, you know? It's time to move to the next level, right? Especially gratitude. Right. So when a person's shut down, do peace, bring them into the sadness. Get them to actually feel the sadness, right? And then express their feelings with sound, as we talked about in other areas, right? And then if someone's just lost someone, well, you're not really working to get them over it at that point. Just be where they're at, right? It's okay to feel the grief. Sit with it, allow to express it, guide with baby steps. Because, you know, I mean, it's natural to grieve, right? You're not trying to get them over it if they just lost someone. You could show them that they've got all the love in the world by sending sound of love to their own heart. Right? That's really great. Okay, when a person's grieving over a long period of time, peace is good, but gratitude is the ultimate. Right? Get them to a place where you go, you know, it's not a bummer. It's actually incredible that you had this bright light on the timeline of your life, right? Let's make the sound of gratitude, right? And then you can also do a letting go ceremony with sound. And then the higher perspective is it's okay. It's all perfect. It's really just perfect, right? It's not a bummer that you need to keep grieving for years, right? It's not good for you to grieve that long, right? Physically, right? Okay, so that's grief. Pain, oh my God, pain is where I think the potential for helping people is the largest, right? There's basic a, a few areas, diversion, bliss, uh, working on the nerves to the brain, the nerve endings, and repairing the issue. Distraction is really just about doing any music or anything that distracts you so you don't feel the pain. That's cool. But even better is finding music you love because then your body puts out dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins, and it actually sends it through the body. So you're like, you, you've got like these natural drugs. The only problem is it's not actually, it could actually help overcome the pain completely, but it's not really resolving, normally resolving the, the, the cause of the pain, right? Uh, now, whereas with sound and music on the nerves going to the brain, we're talking about we don't have this down yet, but we're talking about finding the actual frequency of the nerves going to the brain and filling them up with sound so there's no pain, right? Or running a song. So you've got like uh, even just one note at the bottom of the nerve and another note at the top that, that pulses it through it. So it's like wingy, wingy, right? So you're running music through that nerve. The potential is really huge. The thing that's really effective that we are doing now is sound on the part of the body causing the pain. When you fill up the nerve receptors with sound, there's no room left for the pain information. You can just tone, although you get tired after a while. But if you just do, you can even do silent toning, and that will help silently, right? But, you know, if you get physical vibration on the body, as long as it j didn't just happen or it's not too bad, then you can get physical vibration on the body and it will completely get rid of the pain. And sometimes it will even repair it. So the ideal though is to actually find the frequency of the part of the body before the pain was there. 
and play that to it, and that's where we're headed with all of this. Or a musical flow through the whole system that actually runs that river of flow, like we were talking about earlier, to break through the, the actual nerve or muscle blockages, right? Whatever's causing the pain, actually do like sound surgery to repair that nerve or repair that muscle. That's where we're headed, right? Now, in this area, we've got some really cool devices. We've got all these, these CDs for bones and, and digestion and, and muscles and nerves and endocrine glands. We've got a dozen CDs that are, you don't listen to. You put the headphones on the body, and they're really effective. But even more effective is the sound pillow or the sound dolphin or the bass pod which you can put on the body with these frequencies, or the base belt. They're really effective for pain. I mean, I have had a guy that had whiplash that came in just a couple of months ago, and he was on, uh, he said he was on a scale of, of uh, 10. He had pain for the last two years on seven, from 7 to 9. And after 15 minutes with this base belt, he... Uh, uh, went down to a two for the first time in two years. I just hurt my back like a week and a half ago. And it was like after 30 minutes, oh my God, I was completely back to normal. It's shocking how effective it is. But the research in the future for this, I mean, we could, we could totally get rid of pain. Okay, I have to tell you, right after my uh, last conference presentation where we set up the Medical Sound Association, Spirit said, oh, you're going to bring sound into hospitals. You've got to do a little recognizance. So I got some kidney stones. Like the week after the conference, after we set up the Medical Sound Association. And I'm laying there in bed, just like on morphine, right? Going, why don't we have frequencies for this, this ureter, right? How come we don't have frequencies for, for, I mean, we already use frequencies to break up the kidney stones, but what about those nerves that are screaming? This is crazy that I'm here on morphine when we could just be playing a frequency. So <clears throat> I got a little firsthand experience on and got me thinking about really how effective this could be. I mean, God kind of messed up when he came up with pain. I mean, it's nice to know that there's a problem. But, you know, he's gone a little overboard, right? Because people are debilitated with it. You can find all of these devices at soundloungecenter.com, right? Okay. Then addiction. Addictions also about finding what music works. Sound tables are really effective. Expressing emotions with sound, you know, because often trauma that creates that addiction and then getting them in their body, whether it's sound tables or tuning forks brainwave entrainment to get their brain back to a stable, consistent vibration, the holding frequency class where we do 11 techniques for challenges and, con uh, and conflicts, connection to spirit. I've come to believe that drug addiction is just a loss of a connection to spirit, and so they're bored to death, right? They're like longing for this excitement of spirit coming in, and so they're just bored, right? I, th I, think, I think it's so working on the spiritual connection, I think, can be really cool if it's appropriate and they're open to it. Then we talked about in the meeting with the Medical Sound Association, we talked about creating a new lifestyle. They could even do sound healing as a lifestyle, right, which is really healing. So their whole lifestyle becomes their healing or helping others as well. Okay. So, right, then we got cancer. You know, I mean, there are. Uh, we've talked about, you know, exploding cancer cells that Anthony Holland's doing, and we can actually, now with the Raman device, we can actually find the harmonic structure of a cell and explode it 100%. Yeah, so the future is really, really good for that. But for now, bliss and peace, because really, it's really about getting the body back to coherence, so it, it's, a, its own immune system kicks in big time. The other thing I've realized is empowerment is really important because it's really the fear of cancer that often kills people or your friends or family's fear. Yeah, so I, mean, I had this one woman I was working with on cancer and she said, you know, I'm doing fine, but it's just everybody around me is freaking out, <laughs> right? So getting back so you can be in full power, like doing a no, like this warning, I'm going to get really loud. No! Right? Really powerfully. Right? So you're setting boundaries. You know, Anita Morjani said that 
the reason her fourth stage cancer went away because she was no longer worried about what people thought about her after she died and went to the light and was filled with universal love, right? Okay. Get them in their body with sound. You know? A lot of times when, when they're in fear, they're not in their body at all, at all. And then, this is huge, emotional clearing. What's the emotion that caused the cancer? Let's make the sound of it and release it, right? There's a full range of techniques we have in our classes. Resonating what's right. Find the natural frequency of that part of the body before it had the cancer and play it on it. And then, you know, going to the higher perspective of uh, sending it love um, and imagining it completely gone. Although, you know, you can also do the whole other level of hospice when people are ready to pass. And sound is so effective there. Okay, okay so that's cancer. COVID, same thing. Ultimately, we could find the frequency of these little suckers. Turn the volume up and explode them. This is not rocket science. This is just basic physics of destructive resonance, right? Okay, those are all the different issues I have. Number one in any one of these issues is, like I said in the beginning, Imagine it's already gone, right? What would it feel like? Think about it yourself. If you've got any issue, seems like everybody's got issues, right? If you've got an issue, imagine it completely gone. What would it feel like if it were completely gone? Imagine. And then make the sound of that. <laughs> Now you're running that energy of it completely gone through the body and the whole body goes, no problem. We are doing perfect, healthy flow then. The body knows how to heal as long as you <coughs> aren't stuck on the fear and the emotional aspect of it. Jamie Lou talked about this in her talk about how effective it is to use the mind to heal physical issues. You can heal yourself. It's the biggest problem of our medical system is you, they say, you can't heal yourself. You can heal yourself. And in our, our conference presentations, I mean, we had Madhu, who healed himself of, of uh, complete paralysis, right? I know. And then uh, um, uh, uh, Lisa Lippincott, she was in bed for two years and then used a gong and healed herself, right? You can heal yourself. Take back your power. Say, yes, I absolutely can. Okay, everybody say it now. I absolutely can heal myself. <laughs> right. Yes, okay. That's really the biggest step, right? Then there's the whole aspect of sound and higher consciousness. Instead of focusing on what's right, I'm sorry, what's wrong, <laughs> like we were just talking about, we're f totally focusing on what's wrong and transforming it. Well, if you just go to a place of bliss, and you can do this by actually using brain maps. I went over this in detail in April in the conference, so I'm just going to do a brief uh, overview of this now. Brain maps are where you find the delta, theta, alpha, and beta map using EEG of a healthy state. And then you can use binaural beats and electrodes on the brain to actually entrain that person into that map. So you could play frequencies to entrain people into a whole map of gratitude or compassion, or love, or joy, right? Just by finding the right frequencies and rhythms of the brain when they were in that state. And this is huge, because when you're in these higher states, you know, heart math, the whole thing, you're with, when you're in these higher states, physical issues often just fall away, right? So you don't even have to focus on what's wrong. You just get high, right? So get the whole map across the brain, right? You can also use ultrasound and electromagnetics and light on the brain to entrain the brain into these higher states of consciousness, including oneness, right? Our, our, our conference last April, Jeffrey Martin talked about being able to use ultrasound on microtubules in the brain to get you into a state of oneness. When you're in a state of oneness, also with glasses, then it's like, <laughs> it's like every issue there is starts to fall away because now that's the ultimate flow where you are one with source, right? And, and all that is. 
and it's a state that we know how to get you to with actual frequencies, which is unbelievable. It's like the we, people have been talking about the where science meets spirituality. Well, you can actually show oneness with an EEG map and use frequencies to get a person there. This is like unbelievable. Ultrasound on the brain is really, really cool or on the microtubules, right? So that's a whole other way of going about it, is just get people into bliss. Get peop get you sound to get really high and not even focus on what's wrong. Focus on what's right. right. Even use frequencies on the pineal pitu pituitary gland and hypothalamus. Oh my God, once you're ready, you gotta be ready, right? Okay, you can use all these, if you use sound and microwaves, ultrasound, infrared, infrared light, and even use geometry at the same time. Oh my God, the potential here is just huge. Use all these different modalities and there's no way that horse is not gonna drink of health and spirit. The potential is just huge to get rid of, ultimately, all disease, right? It's really huge where we're headed with this. Gonna take some more research, but we see the path now. And we already have many things that don't kill people, that don't hurt people, that are really effective, that we just talked about, okay? So, this is huge. So, let's end this way. If you have any issue going on, let's send the sound of love to it right now with a sound. Again, whenever you do sound, you can't do it wrong. It's always perfect, okay? So, send the sound of love to whatever issues you have going on right now. I'll do it too. Now, send this sound of love to everybody on the planet that has issues. A lot of people, everybody that's suffering in any way. for listening and thanks for joining our sound healing conference this year
wish is that we take this information and energy forward and help people on the planet for their highest good. That we all may be completely abundant. Health care for everyone that doesn't hurt anybody. And that we are able to heal ourselves and heal each other completely once again. Relationships are in complete harmony and flow. This has been a presentation of New Earth One Network, your home for New Earth Living. Access information, education, and videos on living from the heart in unity consciousness. Visit newearthone.com.